and you have to love your martial arts family and you'll get it back 10 times over. Hello everyone and welcome to episode 7 of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. My name is Jeremy Lesniak, your host for the show, and also the president of Whistlekick Sparring Gear and Apparel. On today's show, we have Master Lisa Yost, a Taekwondo practitioner from Vermont, but now living and studying abroad. Master Yost and I had a great chat, and I appreciated her fitting me into her schedule. She was in Thailand at the time of our interview and took a break from her final schedule to talk to me. Here it is. Master Yost, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Thank you so much for having me. Well, I'm excited to have you here. Uh, <laughs> You know, I'm I'm going to learn a lot about you today, yeah. which is kind of fun. I mean, we don't know each other that well, so that's kind of neat, mm. and and I'm looking forward to it. Me too. Let's get started. Awesome. So why don't you tell us a little bit about how you got started in the martial arts and when and where and, and all that? Okay, sure. Um, I grew up in Vermont, in Lamoille County. It's a really small place, and... Uh, when I was eight years old, my dad sat me down on our porch and he looked at me and he said, you know, you're going to have to learn to defend yourself. You're going out there and you're going to be a girl and it's always going to be harder for you and I'm just going to put you in martial arts. And I was like, I had no idea what that meant, you know, being eight years old. And I was just like, oh, this sounds really fun. And we went and um, I started at Dunleavy's Black Belt Academy, which was in Morseville, Vermont. And... Um, I mean, we've I've trained a lot under other United instructors from the area, like Master Jordan and Master Philip Snyder and Master, Grandmaster Dion. But um, yeah, my my home has been in at the Morseville Vermont studio, and then it branched out into Newport later. But my brother and I started, and when we were really little kids, and and when you're that age, it's it's just really fun time. It's just somewhere to go and have fun and be with your friends and. I didn't really appreciate martial arts, I think, for what it brought me until much later. I think that's pretty typical. I started a little bit younger than you, and I had no idea what was going on until I was at least... I didn't even have a semblance of what was going on until I was probably 12 or 13. Yeah, same. <laughs> so, but, you know, that's that's okay. I think we all go through that. that no, I loved it. Yeah, yeah I... We we had trampolines in the studio at one point. I can distinctly remember. <laughs> like oh those, wow! Those little mini ones from the nineties. <laughs> oh, I wish I had trampolines. I <laughs> that would have been great. Well, cool. So, let's jump into the the what some consider the big question here: your best martial arts story. Mm. You want to well, tell us one? Yeah, this is kind of a difficult question for me because after. 17 years of training, I think, like I was just saying, martial arts is more of a, a feeling of, of what it's giving me, like a sense of community, and to pick all those little times, you know, out of all those countless hours at the studio and at tournaments, is, it's really hard. So I was asking my, my martial arts friends, my best friends who I trained with for years, and they are like, tell the story about your shoulder. And I was like, oh, man, <laughs> it's, a, <laughs> it's a rough story. Um, I have dislocated my shoulder eight times and had two surgeries to sew it back together. Wow. Yeah. How did, how did that happen? <laughs> the, uh, the first time we were in New Hampshire at a, at a quite a different style of tournament than what I was used to. We, I mean, we've always competed outside our circuit, but not really that far. It was one of the furthest ones for me. And, um, there's a lot of different styles, you know, and with being from a small rural community, you're, you often compete against more or less the same people and you kind of know their style. And it, it was a really great opportunity to get out of that comfort zone and, and to grow. But at the same time, I wasn't expecting certain things. And, and, uh, <laughs> we were, we were spying for the grand champ match and, uh, it was a five point match and I was up I think two or three to one and and um I I just kept throwing these like side kicks to the chest just off the front foot and she just kept walking into them so I kept throwing them and and, <laughs> and uh next thing I know is she grabs my foot with both hands and I remember this distinctly and she just throws me backwards while my foot's in midair and, and I know there was a, a judge sitting behind me because they were sitting and 
in four corners and the four corner chairs not lined up or standing. Um, and I knew there was a judge, a corner judge right behind me. So I put out my right arm thinking he would catch me. And, and the next thing I remember, <laughs> I blacked out. Yes. Like I had to have the rest of the story filled in with me for me because I, I just blacked it out. Next thing I remember, I was sitting on the ground with my legs crossed and I was, I was holding my arm my right arm with my left hand thinking like who's screaming like I'm in the middle of a match stop screaming <laughs> <laughs> and then I realized it was me it was me screaming and uh and they stopped the match and, and they asked me if I can continue and I'm like no like, get master D get master D <laughs> and uh master D comes over and and the uh uh the paramedics come over and and the guy right away like or Master D right away slings up my arm with my belt and, and the paramedic tells me that I've I've broken my shoulder, the, the whole shoulder blade in the back because it was just in a big knot and I was just like, oh, my mom's going to kill me. <laughs> <laughs> I think I was 16 or 17 years old. <laughs> That's the only thing I kept thinking in the ambulances. Sure. Oh, my mom's going to kill me. <laughs> and uh, we were at the hospital and, and the paramedics tell the nurse that I've, that I've broken my shoulder blade and and she looks at it right away and she's like, no, 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 you're fine. Stop crying. <laughs> and, and my friends are just in Master D are standing there like, obviously something's wrong. And it took four hours and an x-ray before they realized it was dislocated the whole time, which is really what caused all the problems. Because with a dislocated shoulder, if you, if you put it back in right away, it's, it's usually fine. Mm. But uh, they finally put it back in and gave me some painkillers and I slept on the back seat of my car the whole like six hour drive home or whatever it was mm. um and uh and then it just kept coming out unfortunately because you know as an athlete you just want to get right back into it it was the middle of tournament season and I was like oh I'll be fine I'll be fine and it was just it just kept coming out with doing stupid things like um I, we were one of my friends and I we were playing a like a game with foam noodles in the studio <laughs> just and I raised my arm up too quick and it came right out and 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 another tournament same thing you know I just I did a back fist too fast and it came out and and stupid other things like when I was at college I in in Canada I just slipped on some ice and <laughs> grabbed the handle of the cab I was getting out of with my right arm it came out and and the last time before I decided to have surgery, it came out in my sleep. So I had my surgery. Oh. <laughs> yeah. It was, wow. <laughs> that's, that's rough. Yeah. But like at that point, I could put it back in by myself. After the third time, I could put it back in by myself. I was wondering that. Was it painful to put it back in? Well, the, the thing with dislocated shoulders is once like it, it, it really sucks while it's out, but as soon as it's back in, the, the relief is instant and then it's just sore. Okay. And uh, so I knew it. So I just I had to like psych myself up, be like, okay, you're gonna do it. You're gonna do it. You're gonna do it. And I just lift my arm up and it slide back in. And uh, oh. <laughs> yeah. So I'm after. Cringing. Yeah, yeah, it was crazy. And and then I had the first one, and and I was still competing for a while, and it was fine. But I mean, I wasn't training or competing nearly as much because I was away at school, and. Um, and then I, I moved to Germany later after I graduated and I was laying in bed and I was brushing my hair before bed and it came out again after two years. Oh. And I was just like, no. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, a few years ago I had another shoulder surgery. <laughs> and How uh, long ago was that? Uh, um, three years ago now. Okay. Yeah. So, and has it been good since? Yeah, now I have I have five metal or five plastic hooks in my shoulder that like have sewed the ligament back onto the bone. <laughs> wow. Yeah. You're, you're bionic. Kind of, but it's it's I'm lucky because they're plastic hooks, so I don't like set off the metal detector when I go to that's, the airport. <laughs> well, good. That's that's pretty intense. What? Is there is there a takeaway for you with that? Is it something you would have done differently? And and I don't just mean in that specific moment because you know hindsight there is always twenty twenty. You wouldn't have put your arm out, but mm -hmm. would you have done something different in your training? Well, I think with these 
sorts of injuries, it's when you're an athlete, especially like when I was at that age, when I was, you know, in my last years of high school, I was really serious about competing and training and I was at the studio almost every day and and you just kind of don't want to accept the doctor's advice that you need to like not move it at all for six weeks. <laughs> Mm. because it feels better and you and you're thinking oh it's fine it's fine and I mean a lot of it had to do with how it came out like the direction it came out like down and forward instead of to the side like most do so the muscles were really torn and I just kind of didn't wait as long as I should have and I don't know and now I'm like I, I can't play I could never be a baseball pitcher not that I ever was <laughs> <laughs> But, uh, like, it just it doesn't go back as far as my left shoulder. Like, I can't play tennis or anything with a racket, basically. And, and my sparring career is kind of over, unfortunately. I can't, I'm not allowed to competitively spar. But technically, I'm not supposed to train anymore at all. But um, Wow. Uh, I mean, I think surgeons have to tell you that. <laughs> sure. I think they so have to tell you that. Yeah. Clearly, you're ignoring that advice. Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't get to train nearly as much as I want to anymore. And, and I am really careful, especially like even just, you know, training, sparring in the studio now. I think after like having to go through combined years worth of physiotherapy and, and stuff, it's it kind of hits you like, OK, I could have avoided a lot of this yeah. if, if I had like paid attention. But it hasn't really held me back from continuing on in taekwondo it's just made me a different type of martial artist i'd say okay hmm. so maybe that even is, is a good dovetail into our next question how has the martial arts made you a better person um yeah it's it's hard to explain to people who have never done martial arts before but i think this podcast is mainly going to reach within the community which is awesome because yeah they're going to know right away when I say that the, the greatest gift that martial arts has given me is my Taekwondo family. And I think that being an athlete is one thing, you know, like I was just saying, being someone who loves to compete and, and loves to go to tournaments is, is one thing. But this emotional bond between your fellow martial artists and all of the support that comes with that is, is the most important thing to me. And now that I live abroad, I mean, no matter how long it's been, whenever I go home, I'm still welcome back, just like right into the family, which is so great. Yeah, martial arts is a family that you you never leave. Right. I mean, you, you know, I, I think sometimes it's harder to get rid of your martial arts family than your biological family. <laughs> Maybe get rid of is the wrong verb, but I think you know what I mean. It's, it's you have them oftentimes in a tighter hold yeah. because of, of the time that you spend with them and what you're doing mm -hmm. when you are with them. Yeah, and I mean, like, you, you support each other in a different kind of way than with your other family or your friends because you all are reaching towards similar personal goals and you're all going through similar personal trials and that creates a connection, you know, that a lot of people just don't understand otherwise, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk about a, how the martial arts has helped you through some rough stuff. Th tell me tell me about a low point in your life. <laughs> um, I, I'm going to talk about something besides my shoulder because I don't think that was so much a low point in my life. I was, I was just kind of more annoyed by it, really. Um, and it's, it's going to sound incredibly stereotypical, but one of the lowest times in my life as in a lot of young teenage girls lives well, I don't even think I was a teenager anymore but you know a young girl's life is I went through this really bad breakup and it was the first time any boy <laughs> had ever broken up with me and it just kind of just shattered my you know my self-worth at the time sure and <laughs> Which is, you know, I mean, looking back, it's kind of silly because you know, as an adult. But in that moment, I mean, there, there are a lot of things that look silly when we look back on them, you know, yeah. as we grow, our perspective changes. But in that moment, that thing, whatever it is, just feels so huge and so daunting. Mm. 
So how did how did your martial arts background help you move through that moment to a place where you could look back on it and laugh? Yeah, well, I think doing like exercising, training, any sort of physical activity is the best thing anyone can do after a breakup, especially if you were the one getting dumped. <laughs> because it's it's not only a distraction, but it also makes you feel better about yourself and and when you reach your own personal goals, you get your self-confidence back. And Taekwondo is, or martial arts in general, is even better, I think. I think it's the best cure for any sort of breakup because you can take out all of that anger and that frustration and actually hit things. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Ho- hopefully you're not, you're not taking too much of it out on your, your friends and your family in the studio. No, like, uh, <laughs> I, I think what we did when the day it happened, we went to the studio and, like... Uh, we had all these little dragon boards, you know, the really, the really small, tiny boards that you can break when you, when you like squeeze your wrists together, just like yeah. those little ones. And uh, I think we just lined them up, and we like, just my, my friends were there, and we just like broke, I don't know, twenty or thirty of them, just you know, yelling and letting out your anger. And then I had a good cry on the mat, which is <laughs> awesome. And it, yeah, and 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 then. You get this sense of achievement, too, I think, from facing this depression or this, you know, this low point and facing it head on and and really just doing something physical with it gives you a a serious achievement. And it just, I mean, now I look back and I'm, I'm almost thankful that that happened because it really made me grow as a person and, and, you know, like I said, I, I, I could just go cry on the mat in the studio because uh, the studio is, 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 like I think for a lot of people, it's my safe place, it's my happy place, and it's my second home, and, and that's where I want to be when I'm feeling low. I I don't know how I could say anything to, to sum that up better. That's fantastic. <laughs> um, and yeah, I, I think we most of us have had personal experiences that, that mirror not just the the, let's call it the problem there, but the solution. Mm-hmm. And I know of people that have dealt with more chronic depression issues that have been helped by the martial arts. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Name somebody other than your primary instructors mm. that's been really influential in your martial arts career. Um. Like I mentioned in the beginning, I, uh, though I have one primary instructor, we we have a big, I'm lucky, I'm really lucky to have a close-knit group of um, instructors in the area, in, in the Vermont area, who are excellent instructors, and we've trained there a lot, and they're also a, a really important part of my Taekwondo family and, and on my martial arts growth, but if I had to pick one person, I'd say, who really is very special to me besides my my friends and my colleagues and my instructors I have to choose Master Helen Dunleavy I mean like though she's one of my instructors now um she came into my taekwondo life somewhat late later than um a lot of the other people I've mentioned and and uh, I consider her a second mom, a confidant, like a friend and someone whose advice I, I greatly value and we keep in touch to this day even though I'm gone and I just love her to death. So if you're listening, Helen, I love you. <laughs> so what, tell us a little bit about what Helen's done for you. I mean, you kind of gave us some top-down stuff, but mm-hmm. how has she helped you in the martial arts I mean, that could be an example, or you could just tell us some some more stuff about her that's been helpful, you know. I think anybody who knows Helen knows that uh, she's a really strong person, and I think the only aspect of her personality that's greater than her personal strength is her kindness and her capacity to, to love people. And it's this unconditional love combined with the ability to tell you to you know, get your stuff together <laughs> <laughs> that uh, makes her such a uh, an amazing person to know and um, I, I remember one day um, we were teaching I think a women's class in, in Morrisville together quite recently last time I was home in Vermont so like two years ago 
And uh, we had some time to kill, so we just went to a cafe and had coffee, and I just told her all of the things that were going on my in my life, and I was going through some um, hard stuff with uh, my career and moving and um, and stuff like that. And I just, like, poured it all out to her, and she just sat there and listened and, like, gave me really great advice, but also just was a friend when I needed her. So I think Helen balances this aspect of being a, a teacher and a friend really, really well. That's great. I think it's, I don't know if easy is the right word, but quite common for us in the martial arts to have mentors, if you, if you want to use that word, people that we can look up to in that way because they they train with us you know we're we're all engaged in sort of that same journey mm -hmm. and you know in in Helen's case um of course i know her um <laughs> she she's a little bit further down her path chronologically she, you know she's got a few years on you mm -hmm. so she can offer some perspective that you know we we all like to talk to somebody from time to time that's a little bit older that can share things so i think that's great that you've got her I do too. I'm I'm really lucky to have her in my life. So you you've kind of answered the next question. So I'll twist it. We know you've done martial arts competition. At, at least you've been to <laughs> one. Um, <laughs> so let's let's pose the question a little bit differently. What did you enjoy? Because unfortunately now it's past tense. What did you enjoy about martial arts competition, and what did you take from it? Well, I still enjoy competition. I mean, I, I go to all of the competitions when I'm home. <laughs> I love judging. I love being a part of the leadership team. And I love, uh, you know, making days special for other people and cheering on my friends and colleagues and, and stuff like that. And um, I don't It's It's really funny because when I was looking at this question, I was like, oh, I don't even remember the first tournament I went to. Because I've just I've been to so many that I remember the day my parents stopped coming. <laughs> because I went to so many, they're like, "Okay, <laughs> we know how it's gonna go." <laughs> I'm gonna, I think it. I think it was. I had just um, moved into the adult uh, segment, like the the adult category of competition, and they're like. Well, it's gonna it's gonna be like eight hours before you compete. So. <laughs> Call us when you're going. <laughs> um, give give them the play by play by phone, right? Yeah, I just come home with my medals. And it's it's adorable though because my parents still um, in our in my childhood home have a, a whole wall of just every like board I've broken in competition oh. and all my medals from when I was a kid and like my trophies and stuff. <laughs> I even so have... They, were, they huh? were clearly much more supportive than you first made them sound. Yeah, no, they, they're really supportive and, and, and they love it. They just, uh, um, I think when I started competing in the adult category and I could also drive myself, they're like, oh... It's it's eight hours and we've got a lot of things to do. <laughs> um, I know I love competition and and I like I mentioned earlier, the really cool thing about our circuit is too is like, like all the girls in my age group. We had a, there was I think there was like twelve of us, twelve of us, and in between like seven and ten of us would always be at each competition and we're all the same age and the same rank more or less and and we became really good friends and like we'd go like glow bowling and, and like all those like things that you do as a teenager well I still like doing them now but sure. <laughs> uh afterwards so hmm? no go ahead yeah so it, it was just like I, I had this huge friend circle of girls my age and rank who who loved the same things I did and of course you just click right away so I think that for me was always way more fun than actual competition so building that family in another direction you know your your studio family and then your competition family you're just bringing people into that circle of yours yeah, yeah. Okay. I mean, when you're when you're a teenager, you see it more. It's just like, yay, people get me. <laughs> they understand why I spend every afternoon 
after school, like in this tiny little space. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So if you could train with anybody, if there was somebody that wasn't, that's not in your circle, somebody, any martial artist, living or dead, who would you pull in? Oh man, uh, is it is it too cheesy to say Bruce Lee? <laughs> it is not too cheesy. <laughs> It's a common response, so really? tell us why. Maybe you have a different reason why. Uh, I think Bruce Lee is just, like, the coolest martial artist ever. Um, I mean, there's probably people who are just as talented and just as dedicated, but they haven't reached mass audiences. And um, Although I grew up watching Jackie Chan movies in the 90s and 2000s, and yeah. I loved Jackie Chan. He was the coolest person ever I think as I got older I started appreciating older films more and like the martial arts aspects more over the comedy aspects mm -hmm. and um yeah I mean and and then I also like would really love to say a woman like I, I was thinking about it and I was like man there's got to be there's so many like badass female martial artists out there but the, again all, the only one I could think of that like I really sort of idolized as a kid was uh Michelle Yeoh from uh Crouching Tiger Hidden Dragon yeah like she just was the coolest person ever when I was, like, watched She's that. fantastic mm -hmm. yeah okay so you named a few movies in there do you have a favorite martial arts movie uh, oh, yeah, I guess I already went through that. <laughs> uh, otherwise, um, I think the best martial arts movie, I know it might be a little controversial. Other people might have other ideas. But um, I think the best one I've ever seen uh, is Ip Man. And yeah. I, it's just yeah, we've, so cool. We've had that mentioned a few times oh. on this show. So, of course, you know, like always, it'll be linked in the show notes. And how about a, a favorite martial arts actor that could still be Bruce Lee, but is it? <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, I don't, uh, yeah, I think like I was saying when I was a kid, it was, it was more towards Jackie Chan just because I thought he was the funniest thing ever. Um, but now I, I'd say Bruce Lee because his talent is just unrivaled. I think. Absolutely. How about books? Any martial arts books that you've read that you'd like to sh share with us? Uh, I, I don't think so. I, I haven't really read any martial arts books, to be honest. I have a copy of um, Taekwondo by, <laughs> by the general. General Cho's Bible. Yeah, I have a copy okay. of that at home. Um, but otherwise, I don't actually have any martial arts books. I have sad to say. Okay, well... Maybe maybe it's time to read some. Yeah, if so, all my martial arts friends who are listening, Christmas present this year. <laughs> there you go. There you go. And, and of course, in, in other episodes, we've talked about other books. So you can listen to some of the other episodes of the show and, and maybe you'll get some ideas. I definitely will. I'll, I'm, I'm hesitating from making suggestions because... There are some good ones that people have recommended that I have to go read. You know, it's like mm. now once or twice a week as I'm doing these interviews, my book list is growing. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'll have to make some more time for reading. Yeah. Any martial arts type goals for the future? Something you're you're really looking hard at wanting to make happen? Um, <clears throat> my biggest goal was always, <clears throat> sorry, my biggest goal was always to get my fourth degree black belt, my master's, and uh, I achieved that goal two years ago, um, and it was, it was a really emotional day for me, and um, I was just so grateful to be able to uh, have that time, because I think all good martial artists know that if you go away for a while, and aren't uh, training as much as you're used to. It's it's difficult to get back into it. It's difficult to get your body back into shape. It's difficult to get your mindset back into making training a priority. And I had a rare opportunity to do that last time I was home. So that was really, really big for me. And now my goal is to um, just keep practicing until I get a chance to go home again. I've been to a lot of studios <laughs> abroad 
uh, and try to train and I found it really difficult. So I mainly train at home and I'm lucky because my partner, he also does martial arts. So he and I can train together, which is really great. Um, oh, cool. Yeah, so I think my, my goal right now is not so much uh, in terms of rank. I think it's more in terms of keeping up um, my skill ability for basic movement and strength and things like that. Well, that's, you know, that might even be a harder goal because, as you said, you know, you're away, you're away from your martial arts community and you're in school, you don't have a schedule to say, well, maybe you do, but you don't have a defined class time to go to the dojang and mm. say, I'm going to train this place this time. Because mm. that's easy to plan out. Yeah, exactly. And um, dorm rooms are incredibly small. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So practicing your patterns is, uh, is difficult sometimes. I, I can empathize. Mm. So that brings us to our last question. Do you have any advice to sign off with for the people listening? Uh, yeah, I mean, I I don't want to sound too preachy or too... No, preach on. This is your chance. <laughs> tell us what you think. Uh, I really, I just, I just got to tell everybody out there that... Um, the biggest thing that I've learned through my training is you'll only ever get out of martial arts what you put into it. So you have to train hard, you have to study hard, and you have to love your martial arts family, and you'll get it back ten times over. Very well said. Thank you. <laughs> well, cool. Um, Master Yost, I want to thank you for being here on Whistle Kick Martial Arts Radio. I really appreciate your time and had a lot of fun interviewing you. Yeah, it's so much fun, and I love your spying gear. <laughs> well, thank you. That that was completely. You're not the first person to do that, but I want people to know this is unprompted. This is the... when people come on the show, I don't tell them you have to say something about whistle kick. No, this is just. But it's and, true. And you mentioned it on. Thank you, and I appreciate that. We're doing what we can. All right. Thank you so much for having me. I want to thank you for listening to this episode of Whistle Kick Martial Arts Radio. A big thank you to Master Yost for sharing her story with me. Please be sure to subscribe to the show so you never miss one of our weekly episodes. If you do like the show, we'd really appreciate a five-star review on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever it is you download your podcasts. You can check out the show notes at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. And while you're over there, if you want to be a guest on the show, or you know someone that would be a great addition, please fill out the guest form. And of course... If you'd like to learn more about the quality sparring gear and other products we offer at Whistlekick, please check us out at whistlekick.com. Train hard, smile, and have a great day.